thinking about for new, G, new missions having to do with GRBs um, in my work with the people at uh, the Extreme Universe Laboratory. Um, I'm motivated by um, the fact that we're kind of in an in-between era because we sort of have no pipeline or an unfilled pipeline of missions because um, SWIFT is going to stop working in a few years. It can't work forever. Um, there's few planned missions. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. And we have kind of, we're in a time of kind of modest resources. So what can we do for gamma ray burst science now? Um, I, want to I want to remind you instrumental people, like where is Philippe, um, that I don't think about um, instruments in a good way, in a, in a way to do the most science. I'm only thinking about gamma ray bursts, and that may be my downfall, but that's where I'm coming from. Um, and I, I sort of ignore the other capabilities. Okay, so uh, I'm thinking about what we could do with limited resources and like, for example, what we could do with just the people in this room and their laboratories and their abilities. So I want to talk about today about what we don't know and don't know about gamma ray bursts, uh, what we need to learn more about them, and uh, what is new that I've been learning in looking at new possibilities for missions, which I think is rather surprising. We're in a rather surprising time with a rather amazing amount of new possibilities for uh, detectors. So we start um, saying that we do actually know a lot about long gamma ray burst light curves. We actually have now hundreds from SWIFT. And so actually in some sense that makes it more challenging because we have to, we have to do something new. What can you do? There's nothing you can get in the 151st light curve that you didn't get in the 150th. Um, we know that gamma ray bursts extend well into the epoch of reionization, which is supposed to be finished by a redshift of six. We have now about five examples of that. We know, okay, gamma ray bursts come from star forming regions associated with massive star supernovae. They're not obviously standard candles. Uh, we know that the afterglows are related to prompt emission in a well-defined correlation because of the recent paper by Bernardini. We know a lot of things, but there's a more things that we don't know. So we don't really know the Z distribution, the, the redshift distribution of gamma ray bursts beyond you know, a few because we have so few. We have, okay, five at high redshift, and that's, that's five is not a very detailed um, luminosity function. We, know, uh, a, we don't really know the detailed prompt emission mechanism or how the progenit or what actually makes this. We don't, can't tell us if it's a really, really, really uh, all uh, synchrotron. We can't tell you if it ends up in a black hole or a neutron star. Uh, we don't really know the relation of prompt optical and gamma emission because theories are wildly off. Um, by factors of, many, of ten, several factors of 10. We don't know the origin of, of, uh, short, of the short bursts. We have no idea this is a huge mystery. Um, and of course, there's much more, but I think that these, some of these big uh, uh, points we can make some progress on just by sort of getting better instruments. Um, and here's how. Um, so um, if you think about how to do better on high redshift gamma ray bursts, um, there's a very nice study by Burroughs um, for um, sort of in support of the Janus mission. And basically, um, they compared a standard coded mass telescope, the kind that SWIFT uses, to um, sort of more exotic optical ideas like lobster optics and things of this nature. And, and kind of reading between the lines, what you really got is that the most critical thing is not so much the technology, but in fact the field of view. It's not that the lobster eye optics failed in somehow technologically. It's really, it's, you need a large field of view. So we're kind of stuck with, hot, with, with sort of typical coded masks, it seems. Um, the general expectation for high redshift gamma ray bursts is that they're going to be at very low energy. In fact, the Janus team uh, had an instrument that didn't even go past uh, 30 keV, I think. Um, and so, there, so the general expectation is you really need a very low energy instrument. To, uh, to do well here. Um, I'm gonna remind you that um, the peak of, um, of long bursts is, is, I said 200, so about 160. Um, and so if you divide that by one plus Z, you'll find that the peak of, the, of energy is um, around uh, 30 keV and below. And so, you, so lower energy is, is the idea, generally speaking, is to go to much lower energy. Um, there is little support for this. Um, when you look at the, f at, the f at the really high redshift gamma ray bursts, you'll find that most of them uh, were not bright enough or were somehow not observed well enough to really find out where the peak was. So it's not obvious that this is, that this is really the case. You can't plot Z versus um, the peak energy and find a hugely obvious trend. There's a huge scatter like everything else we get in gamma ray bursts. Um, uh, and and I, what I really want to point out is that 
is that uh, I'll, I'll talk a lot today about the, sh the short gamma reverse and the long gamma reverse difference with different instruments. And so we have, we have you know, Batsy and Fermi that get more shorts and we have uh, Swift that gets less. Well, there's nothing quite like that in the terms of the, of the high redshift burst. There's no heady operated for a very short amount of time and it was, uh, and even though it was a softer instrument, um, it didn't operate for, for uh, it, I mean, it didn't operate very long and wasn't very sensitive. So it's like it could just, just could have been too insensitive to ever find any high redshift burst. We have no idea if, if we just quadrupled the sensitivity if suddenly high redshift burst would start showing up all over the place. But that's the general idea. Um, so uh, of course, high redshift bursts are really interesting um, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, one of the things that I have been thinking about is the epic of reionization, okay? And so um, we have this simple idea. You um, have a gamma ray burst, and every time you measure its spectrum and you find a line, you say, aha, look, um, this must have been neutral. It is in some sense mapping the line of sight for every time you get a gamma ray burst. So we've had, um, I think, a thousand Batsy bursts, something like that, and the whole sky is completely populated. Eventually, if you went with Swift, the whole sky would be populated. If you had your fancy high redshift gamma ray burst observer, well, hopefully you would have the whole sky populated and you'd have hundreds of lines of sights in these spectra. And you would map this EOR. From just this crummy spectra, they said, okay, after a redshift of 6.7, there's a problem, you know, the, they, they estimated the, um, the uh, for, certain, for certain assumptions, they estimated the total um, uh, neutral fraction. So this is, this is cool stuff. You need a lot of gamma reverse and you need a lot of high redshift ones to do it. But we can start doing it this way. Um, I want to note very strongly is that um, this is a real spectrum from a, from a Z of 6.7 object, which is ridiculously hard to do. There's no possibility, no hope, not even the vaguest hope you would ever get a spectrum like this from the Hubble, deep, Hubble Ultra Deep Field Galaxies. No way. Forget it. Give up. Um, so um, uh, I, keep, I keep stressing we don't really know very much about how this is really going to end up. And if you it just, uh, you can look at the Wanderman and Piran um, uh, what work, wonderful work trying to put together the luminosity function of gamma ray bursts uh, and, and how they look at high redshift. But um, if, you, if you look at that paper and you look at the error bars, there's plenty of room for surprises, of course. Um, so we talked about the emission, emission mechanism, uh, I think, yesterday, and we've had a lot of discussion about this. And so the big question is, are gamma ray bursts polarized? And the answer is, well, one is. <laughs> We think we're pretty we're pretty sure, um, and um, there's very limited data on this one. Um, the optical polarization, by the way, um, varies a great deal. There's not a whole lot of really good prompt um, optical uh, polarimetry, um, but we may learn something from this as well. Uh, but we still, to answer the question of is the basic emission mechanism surely synchrotron, I think I think the theorists have to spend some time starting to think about the ugly details of, of all the scattering that could happen in between us and the source. They have, to, they have to make sort of more solid predictions. Okay, you know, you better make a prediction in advance and let's go measure it. And, and so to, to really nail this down, really lay to rest this question of do we really know this is synchrotron, yes or no? Okay, um, uh, don't forget that Compton telescopes and even instruments like New Star can get polarization. Um, uh, but the point here is that one measurement is usually doesn't make so much progress and there's still room for very important contributions made from polarization measurements. Uh, one of my favorite questions is what's the relationship of prompt gamma emission and prompt optical emission? Um, I'm going to talk about this some more in, in my next talk, but um, SWIFT takes about 60 seconds, uh, sorry, takes about 60 seconds at an absolute minimum, normally more than 100 seconds to get to to point its optical telescope at these gamma ray bursts. So we actually know very little about this region in time. And um, as I said, in some of the famous gamma ray bursts, like the naked eye burst, um, the optical is hopelessly orders of magnitude away from typical predictions. And if we understood this, we'd understood the, understand these explosions much better. Um, although I don't want to slight ROTC and other instruments from the ground who've done wonderful jobs occasionally in getting these um, very soon, um, I want to remind you that uh, if we had this kind of information on many bursts, we would have great stuff. Um, I think you've seen this many times. This is the um, X-ray light curve uh, from, uh, from the bat. And these red um, points are from Tortora. 
and uh, other things, and there's some sort of vague correlation. Maybe there is um, a lag, maybe there isn't. Maybe there are some anti-correlations, maybe there are not. There's counterexamples to this. There's um, some uh, uh, light curves published by V-Strand, which are clearly anti-correlated. Well, why are they sometimes correlated? Why are they sometimes not correlated? I think there's a lot of interesting physics in this that we got to go out and measure. Um, and um, once you have rise times for these bursts, you have some good physics. You can try to do things like measure the bulk Lorentz factor in the optical, compare that to those which are theoretically problematic, I think, in Fermi. Um, you can do cross correlations to look for um, signals. And you can think about the delay between not just the highest energy gamma rays and low energy gamma rays and optical now, or many orders of magnitude, but eventually the delay between, okay, those signals and gravitational waves and neutrinos. Um, but this is incredibly rare. There's not been only one of these in seven years, one of this quality. So we need better instruments to go and get more of this. Another exciting thing you can do with prompt optical is look at dust, okay? Gamma ray bursts are supposed to be so powerful and have so many hard photons. They're supposed to be able to evaporate all the dust around a star forming region. So the idea is you start with this, um, this embedded uh, star here that's a supermassive star that's in the star forming region and all these supernovae blow and all this dust all, all over the place. The gamma ray burst goes off and it slowly eats away a cocoon and eats out the dust. Well, in this case, when you start this, this process, some infrared might get out a little bit and much later the blue would come up. So if you measured two bands simultaneously, not just the, not just the one in, in Swift, for example, but if you had two telescopes, two bands, or a dichroic as I like, um, you could watch, just look at the ratio of flux and for reasonable extragalactic um, extinction laws, you could follow the extinction just like this in time. As a matter of fact, if you think about this, there are very complicated things going on because there's the small dust on a very small scale near the star, okay? Then, you, then the ex explosion um, expands a great deal. Then, it'll, then it'll, it'll wipe out this dust, but then it'll be shining through more dust if from the galaxy, from local things, and you could see all sorts of dust effects. And what's really interesting is that you can learn about dust in protostellar clouds at incredible redshifts. There's no other way of doing this. Subject to um, how red your band passes are, of course. So um, soft gamma ray bursts, okay. We have about 15 soft gamma ray burst light curves um, in, in, that, that count for anything like prompt emission. We have about 15 of them. These are all disgusting. Most of them are about three points with huge error bars, okay. How are we ever gonna nail down the question of, you know, well, is this really from some kind of binary star? Is this really from some kind of supermassive star? Unless we start really getting many more of these Okay? I would love to build a machine that will give us not just 15 light curves over seven years, okay? but why don't we build a kind of machine that will give us this kind of quality data from, gamma, soft, from short gamma ray bursts. We don't have anything even vaguely like that. And why not build an instrument for hundreds of them? Okay, so this is my dream, and this is a hard dream. And I'll show you why in a second when I finished with these, with these topics and go to start talking about instruments. Um, so what do we need to do these, to, to fulfill these dreams of mine? Okay, so I, I have a little joke here, in which case I made a Batsy, and I, st and I bolted on the side of that a, a, a Swift, and I bolted on the side of that an Icarus, saying that, um, well, I'd love to have an instrument that did everything, that got the short gamma ray burst, that somehow located those, and that also got polarizations. We have the technology to do this, all we have need is the money, or, okay, probably more importantly, the imagination and the work. Okay, um, again, I'm thinking, I'm, again, when people say I want to do beautiful spectra of the, of the titanium lines around our galaxy or in the center of the galaxy center, I just think like, forget it, I don't care. I want these things localized, okay, and I'm only going to be looking at all these questions about things that can localize. So, let's talk again about that, uh, the low energy response to get high redshift bursts and learn about the early universe. Um, okay, um, the typical gamma ray burst peaks at about 160 keV. Did I get that from your paper, Laura? I think I probably did. Um, and um, that means that observed the peak is gonna be somewhere in the, in, the, in the range of 10 keV. Very low energy, okay? And um, for super duper much higher bursts, that's when you need, you know, down in the few keV range, which is actually quite hard. Swift bat detectors have no response below 15 keV. 
And this is actually a consequence of electronics. It turns out that if you go and you say um, to the most expensive technology companies, you say, build me a gamma ray detector, they say, sure, no problem. And they take your money, they'll come back, and they'll give you a gamma ray detector that's pretty good, and it'll probably be pretty good from around, from around the 20 keV to around the 150 keV. That's because to make the electronics to get low noise down below this limit is extremely difficult. It's something that takes uh, your team of experts working on this in a concentrated way for years. Don't believe anybody who says otherwise. Um, uh, some of these technologies that can get down to low, that can get below 15 kV require cooling the detector plane. I'll talk about that a little, little later. Um, but not all of them do because Janus, for example, the silicon detectors, no cooling, got down to f half a kV. So we have incredible new technologies that will get us to these low energies. Um, unfortunately, Janus did not get a start. Um, SVOM was pl uh, planned to have a cadmium telluride array cooled to minus 20 C. Unfortunately, it's having a little trouble getting started. We're not sure where that's going to go. So I think that we need to invent this future ourselves. Um, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about choices of detectors for this uh, in, um, a, a, in the end of this talk. Um, there's another way, to, by the way, to address high redshift, which we've heard about from Anatoly Ayudin, which is his GROM kind of instrument, which uses nuclear uh, resonances to, to get the redshift just from gamma ray bursts, just, for, just from the gamma information. That's very exciting, especially if you could localize those bursts with some kind of variant of this instrument. Um, I want to point out that Jochen Greiner is on some of these papers as well. Um, and um, uh, I'm not sure about the order of this particular slide, but uh, I mentioned earlier talking about getting early um, information on um, optical, and um, we're involved here at the Extreme Universe Laboratory in the Ultrafast Flash Observatory. We have a Pathfinder experiment that we think is now launching in April of 2013. Um, probably. probably. Um, and it's like a micro SWIFT. It has a coded mask X-ray imager to locate the gamma ray burst in a very coarse way, and then it follows up with a mirror steered beam of an optical telescope to be there within a second. So this is very exciting for getting this prompt optical information. I'll talk more about this later in another talk today. Um, it's a very small instrument. Um, it's, um, the PI is um, Il Park, but we have very important participation here at Moscow State University uh, with our spacecraft and with other instruments on this Lomonosov spacecraft. Um, we're also, I'm thinking toward the future, however, after this, in sort of a next generation rapid response telescope. And I'll talk about some of those designs. The idea is why not scale this up to swift size, thousands of square centimeters, a 30 centimeter optical telescope, 30 centimeter aperture, and why not add an infrared camera to do this dust work that I was talking about earlier. Uh, we're discussing many possibilities, and, and I'm not promising anything here, but we're discussing many possibilities, possibly having piggyback launches on different kinds of spacecraft that we may have access to through our excellent colleagues. Um, so uh, I wanted to just briefly talk about the way that you can do this, have these two si simultaneous measurements in the optical and the infrared, is to have sort of a typical, um, typical infrared sensitive chip, a typical optical chip, and you have uh, the beam come through the telescope and just split it with a dichroic. These dichroics are very beautiful. You can just order them out of the catalog. They have very sharp splits of the two bands. You get two wide bands. You can look at the um, ratio of these fluxes and look at the reddening uh, as it happens in real time. Again, um, these models predicting that this all happens in the 60 second time scale at low redshift. Um, talk about, we talked about polarization already, so I don't want to talk about it too much or the instruments. But uh, I just want to remind you that Compton telescopes, anybody who says we have a Compton telescope has a possibility of measuring polarization information. Information can also be extracted from consideration of nearest neighbor hit patterns in many pixelated imaging detectors. Uh, New Star, of course, will also have some polarization capabilities. Um, and don't forget GROM, because we'll be getting that from, from our own instrument here, GROM. Um, so what about going to higher energy? What about this problem? to get the, the, the short bursts. How do we get those hundreds of bursts? Um, so I'm just going to remind you that MEV instruments, like BATSI, got almost 50% um, shorts. So we're really in a working in a, in a paucity of these. 
Um, Swift only goes up to 100 keV. Well, okay, no bursts. And it's pretty easy to see why the peak of the, of the longs is about 160 keV. The peak of the shorts is about 500 keV. Swift just doesn't get many photons from this. Um, and it doesn't get much imaging through the mask. Um, just to remind you, these are sort of um, typical average values of slopes. A uh, nice little bit of steep slope here for the long burst. The short burst will be uh, much flatter, but always weak. Um, I just arbitrarily made these cross at around 50 keV. Okay, these short gamma ray bursts don't turn over until, uh, until MEV sort of ranges, and uh, so half an MEV ranges, but the L LGRBs turn over just around past 100 keV, about 200 keV, 160 keV. Okay, you start integrating these, and what do you get? Um, you notice that the um, long bursts turn over with integration at a couple hundred keV, and the short bursts do not. If you put this in terms of signal to noise, by cheating and, and doing this absolutely wrong, I just want to tell everybody this is done wrong, just for a quick estimate, only the, only the DXRB, the diffuse background, is done here. Okay, look at how this signal to noise ratio just keeps going past 200 keV for shorts, but not for longs. It turns over. So um, what is the big deal? Why is it so hard to do high energy? Okay, the real answer um, is that, um, is not just that Swift has little instrumental response past 200 keV. Here's Swift, here's the instrument cutoff, here's the BATC instrument efficiency, that's 200 keV. Okay, that's not really the whole reason. Who's a student in here? All the students raise their hand. <laughs> okay, let's just raise their hand, okay. Um, this is something I, I keep trying to teach some of our Korean students, they don't get, get this. It's the background. It's really the background. That's what this is really all about. This is why this is much harder to go to higher energy. Okay, and so this beautiful figure that I stole from Von Balmus, who's, who was talking here Wednesday, um, shows that you have um, activation, and so the Earth and your spacecraft and everything around it glows with this horrible stuff here. So here's the, here's, the, here's the region where Swift operates and gets most of its photons, okay? And here's the MEV range. Yuck. Okay, this is the problem. This is what makes high energy instruments heavier and harder to build and more expensive and more difficult to put on spacecraft. Um, so this is a hard job. Um, we have um, a sense of what this is, this is looking like if you look at the Swift background. Okay, so this is a nasty SAA passage. Somebody think about what this looks like? Somebody has some sense of this? Well, this is, of course, an exponential decay. You go through the SAA, you go through radiation belts, you go through, and you get a decay. You go through, you get a decay. You go through, you get a decay. And that's what, um, and then that's, that's our problem. Um, so what's the best way to make a high energy instrument if you're like me and all you care about is gamma ray bursts and those people who want to do boring things like clouds of funny lines, I don't care, go away. Okay, well, how do you do this? Well. Um, to quote again from Van Balmus's talk, when you're talking about instruments in the MEV range, you use words like terrible, unlucky, very difficult, and crazy, okay, because of this background problem, and you don't get the advantage of pair telescopes. Um, so, uh, and I'm gonna do much worse than Van Balmus because I'm gonna require less than 15 arc minute location for these bursts, okay? Because I wanna go follow them up with, a, with an optical or other telescope. Uh, and I want to, I insist on a large field of view. The answer is, is you can stick a coated mask, a Swift-like kind of, kind of method of localizing gamma rays. You can stick it in front of one of these higher energy devices, okay, which has active shielding, active detectors to get rid of um, uh, things from the spacecraft, from, from below and so forth. And, um, and then you end up with a very heavy multi-layer, okay, a heavy complex multi-layer instrument like um, ISGRI on um, Interpol. Okay, much more complex, you have to active, active shielding and veto. Um, and uh, you can do this, you can do this with tracking instruments like we've seen, talked about in this meeting already. Um, uh, 10 arc minutes is possible but not common. Um, for tracking instruments, you usually use something complicated like germanium, although we've had other things like um, micro, um, micro gas uh, detectors. But these require a lot of onboard processing and as I've had some discussions with colleagues, um, you would probably have to run this in a mode where you only looked at where the hits were compared to the mask, and then much later you would reconstruct it in the standard Compton sort of way. Um, there's another kind of interesting idea that I saw um, that we're working on at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, which is you take a mask, you know, masks are, you know, tiles, holes, usually square, 
that are open or closed, and you're looking for the shadow of that. You take those tiles where it's closed, and you stick little detectors on them. This is a detector that has been developed by the um, detector lab um, in the Nuclear Science Division at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. It's completely packaged with electronics and everything in one centimeter. Now, with the typical coded mass cameras, you have very small pixels, and you may not be able to do this in a simple way. But this gives you an idea of how you can take these coded masks, which throw away half of your light, and you can get more high energy information from them by making the mask active. It's a very clever idea. OK. So um, this is a very exciting time to be thinking about instruments because there's so many new detectors available. Um, some of us um, remember the days where all we had was a little chamber with gas and a wire running through it. Things are way better than that now. Um, at the low energy, you have silicon detectors. The silicon detectors are very exciting because they have no cooling. Okay, and it, to give you an example of this, Janus, their idea was to pull out their credit card, go to the Teledyne store, and to say, can I please have a detector? Teledyne actually makes this detector, any, any one of you, again, can pull out your credit card and buy this, which has a response from a half a keV to 20 keV. They give you the readout electronics and everything off the shelf. How much does it cost? Uh, that's a different matter. <laughs> um, you, your, your, your credit card may not cover it, uh, depending on how good your credit history is. Um, so, excuse me, without cooling? I'm sorry, without cooling. Uh, oh, oh, so it's the allies because of uh, uh, noise. Um, it's because the electronics are good. It's the electronics are very low noise. Well, but uh, uh, the internal noise of a uh, silicon detector? I think um, they're very thin. You only have 20 very keV thin. response, right? Very thin? They're very thin. You only have 20 keV response. That's all. It's not a high energy detector. It's a very low energy detector only. Um, Astro H has double sided silicon strip detectors, DSSSDs. Uh, again, these are now available as a commer commercial product. I had a guy ask me to please buy his product, which had 25 micron spacing. So you can have these incredibly fine resolution detectors now. You just buy them off the shelf. So if, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, the idea is you have these um, electrodes that have lines. One side goes in X, one side goes in Y. By localizing both X and Y where there's a hit, you can actually localize, you, you actually localize where the hit is and you can have a position sensitive detector just like a pixelated detector. Note, however, that these strip detectors ha are in some sense go like N Whereas pixelated detectors go like n squared. Now, if your electronics cost a lot of money, and commercial, you know, commercial A6 detectors, you know, they can ask you for you know thousands of dollars per channel. This is, makes a big difference. There were, um, I think, tens of thousands of channels in Swift, and this will be the square root of that. Um, now, this, so look at this crummy um, high energy response. Well, the thing is, is that you can make these in layers. You can make all the layers you want. Now they're cheap, and they're few channels. So ten layers, no problem. This is um, something in Takeda et al. He had stacked four layers and showed that he had 100 keV response, no problem. These are produced commercially. Um, uh, any kind of radiation detection. Any kind of radiation detection. X-rays and so forth. For medicine, yeah, for medical imaging. For medical imaging. Yeah. Um, so. Um, Okay, so um, you can also cool um, CZT and cadmium telluride, and you can get, to, get down to a few keV. And I, I'll show you, I think I have a right here, um, courtesy of Philippe Laurent. Um, this is his spectrum. Um, he's cheated, he's removed the instrumental pedestal and it averaged some pixels. Okay, but look at this 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. He claims this is a real line around 3 keV. So that's, that's really impressive. So imagine now a minus one spectrum. Okay, how many factors in, in photons do you get going from 15 to three? Yeah, that's, really, that's really great. Okay, um, so, um, so Eclair's used um, cooled CDT, uh, or uh, was supposed to, and, uh, and it had a 4 keV um, low energy response. Very nice. Um, a factor of three or four lower than Swift. Um, it, you do have to cool it to minus 20 C. 
We're not talking about liquid helium, though. We're just, on a spacecraft, it's pretty typical, you can just have a few thermoelectric coolers. This is a big improvement over having to have a liquid helium doer. So this is not bad. Um, the trick here and is, is forget the difficulty of, of making these and bonding these. Uh -uh. The trick here is the electronics. There's only a few places in the world that can make low enough noise electronics to achieve this 4 keV. This, if you want 4 keV, uh, I suggest you hire five really good engineers and, and, and don't expect them to, fi to finish this for five years. This is really hard, but it's done. Um, there's a, there's a, a project at, um, uh, at Berkeley um, from Steve Boggs um, called the Nuclear Compton Telescope, and it uses uh, germanium double-sided strip detectors. This is a, sort of a typical thing. You stack a bunch of them, and then you can use them as a tracking detector. The volume of this germanium is, is what does it. Uh, little X strips, little Y strips on the other side. You have position-sensitive strips. You go through, you get Compton, use it as a Compton telescope, okay? Um, gives depth information within the germanium and everything. The drawbacks are, this has to be cryogenically cooled. A cryogenic doer in space is nasty. It's tough. Um, and it has to be, it's a very specialized kind of fabrication. I don't believe you can just go buy these with a credit card any day and have to ask them to have to be delivered on Friday. Um, so um, I'm gonna summarize my talk by saying there's lots of topics in gamma reverse science that can be addressed pretty much directly by new instruments. You give me enough money, I'll crank up the number of, of, sh of, uh, of short gamma ray bursts, and we can all write exciting papers on this, okay? Um, there are uh, instruments to do things like get to lower energy and get to higher energy. Some of them are straightforward, almost out of the box, okay, but others require terrible optimization work. So I hope to be involved in the next year or two in optimizing the kind of lightest, lowest mass possible high energy camera, high energy coded mass camera. I tend to um, make a coded mass camera that all the instrumentalists in this room will hate because it has all sorts of throwing away of information. It's not a fancy tracking camera, just a, just a sort of multi-layered camera with a lot of active shielding and I wanna make it as light as possible. And I think that could be a very exciting way to go forward in, in uh, this problem of short gamma ray bursts. Um, and finally, the recent advances in solid-state detectors give us all these tools limited only by your imagination. You young students, you should be thinking about being in some laboratory five years from now, trying to think of new, very clever ways to use all these new semiconductor devices to make new great instruments. Thank you very much. Thank you.